you're always heavy in with the draft and the draft prospects and whatnot. And I probably have the most unpopular opinion on the subject, to be honest with you. But my opinion is my opinion. You know, I truly believe that Fields has done enough to earn at least every start through his rookie contract. It does not mean that you can't have a quarterback behind him. I would totally not be opposed to dropping back and still getting a top 10 draft pick and taking a quarterback. And then I would take that quarterback and I'd sit him and I'd let Justin Fields try and play out his fourth year. You know, I think that would be a win, win, win. You still get a trade back. You still get a new quarterback and you still give Justin Fields an opportunity to play. However, like I said, it's probably the most unpopular opinion right now. People hate it. I did more work on Caleb Williams and there is a lot to be excited about from him. He makes sure to set his feet really fast before he throws. He never makes a stupid Aaron throw because of that. And he does get away from the sack really well. They anticipate him beating 4-6 at the combine. So he's still going to be a fast quarterback, not as fast as Justin Fields. But his escapability is still there. Not as escapable as Justin Fields, okay? But he always places the ball on the numbers, even when he's on the run. The consistency that he puts it right on the receiver's chest so that they can just catch the ball and run, that that is important in and of itself. He does get the ball to all three levels. He does check his reads extremely fast. Basically, a lot of things Justin Fields doesn't has not demonstrated so far. Justin Fields' flaws, we don't know how many percent of it is on Justin Fields and how many percent of it is on Luke Getze and the Bears developing him, but it's there in year three still, okay? And it was there at the beginning of year three. And I was like, geez, I hope they fix this this year. And then at the end of year three, there were still some plays. Justin Fields was just looking downfield and not being able to pull the trigger on a throw. But I've seen enough plays where there's an open receiver that Justin Fields just doesn't see them. I've gone through the A22 for every single game this last year, just from putting video together and whatnot. I don't want to say I've studied it per se, but I've seen it all multiple times. There's plenty of examples where, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, the O-line, the O-line, the O-line, he's getting sacked. Well, you know, there's a lot of avoidable sacks. A lot of times where he drops back and it even looks like he wants to pull the trigger and doesn't. And now it's chaos backyard football time sometimes that ends up with a positive play we saw way more of those positive plays in 2022 than we saw in 2023 but sometimes it ends up with a negative play sometimes it ends up with a fumble or a sack i i keep kind of going back to this comment that i said where i didn't think his floor would still be this low you know what are we hoping here for what are we holding on to here and at the end of the day you got to pay him next year he's gotten sacked 130 times in two and a half years um which is another part of it too you know, Andrew Luck couldn't survive this league. He's on pace to double it. And I know at the beginning of the year, during the offseason last year, at least through mine and David's conversations, our idea was, well, okay, say it does fail or say, you know, he, you don't want to be stuck in the middle here. You could use the middle as a stepping stone, right? But say he does fail or say he's just average enough to where you're still scratching your head and questioning it. You have two first round picks. You could package them together and trade up to get whatever quarterback you want. Well, look at this. Now, number one literally fell into our lap. It's such a unique position to where you don't even have to do that. You could still take the best quarterback out there if you want, and you still have your number nine pick. You know what I mean? And that's really, really enticing, I think. The sentimental guy in me wants to keep Justin Fields, but we're in a business, man. And there's a clock on the contract situation, and I think it's time. I think it's time to get caleb williams this is our shot you know that chiefs team only scored two touchdowns and a field goal it was more of an implosion from the ravens that really led to the result and that particular game i remember at one point they said lamar jackson only has five completions and we were in the third quarter and one of them was to himself that was pretty incredible to me it i hate to reflect this back to justin fields but it just makes you think like where can we really go with Justin Fields? Like if Lamar Jackson is one of the best case scenarios of what Justin Fields can be, I can't just not connect those dots, you know? I never liked that type of train of thought that like, hey, this style of quarterback has not won a Super Bowl. I mean, we've seen some mobile quarterbacks win Super Bowls, you know, going back to uh, Steve Young in the 90s. But even more recently, Russell Wilson was a pretty mobile quarterback, and he was still able to win with that team in Seattle. So the Lamar Jackson to Justin Fields comparisons have been there. 
They've been there for a while now, and mm-hmm. um, we all wish Justin Fields looked anything like Lamar Jackson. You know, Lamar Jackson got an MVP his second year. He's been developed properly with a good coaching staff. He does not have that many weapons around him, though. What but do you think about Marvin Harrison Jr.? He's definitely playing literally above the defender. He doesn't try to, like, just get past them. He's not just trying to run his route and get away from them. He's like, yeah, if the ball is thrown in our area, I can out jump him and just play above him and get the ball that way. That's a fun thing to see. The only other receiver that I've seen consistently play above, literally above the defender is Brandon Marshall. You know, he has all the other tools, too, but I don't want to say too much more because I haven't completed my evaluation of him. But uh, that's just the one thing that stood out to me whenever I watch him play. That's exciting. (laughs) I think he's got a bright future in the NFL. It's just Ryan Poles constantly preaches value. Value Value-wise, is it worth it? So you mentioned Brandon Marshall. Brandon Marshall was a fourth-round pick. If we go through and just take top five wide receivers drafted in the past, we have A.J. Green who did not win a Super Bowl. Calvin Johnson, who did not win a Super Bowl. Braylon Edwards did not win a Super Bowl. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just going off memory here. Larry Fitz was in a Super Bowl, but didn't win one. Charles Rogers did not win a Super Bowl. Andre Johnson did not win a Super Bowl. Peter Warwick did not win a Super Bowl. You got to go all the way back to 1996, where Keyshawn Johnson was taken at number one overall. And he was taken by the Jets. He definitely didn't win one with them, right? The history shows us that a top five wide receiver doesn't necessarily make the impact that, for example, a top five quarterback could make. I think if you're going to sit there and risk that pick, it should be on a quarterback. But my my preferred situation here, dropping back and still getting a top 10 draft pick and taking a quarterback. You know, I think that would be a win-win-win. You still get a trade back, you still get a new quarterback, and you still give Justin Fields an opportunity to play. However, like I said, it's probably the most unpopular opinion right now. People hate it. Um, I think the safest way to go is definitely to just trade back because in no scenario is one player ever worth what multiple players are worth. So if you truly want to go the safe route, I, I think you pass up on both Caleb Williams and Marvin Harrison Jr. But that's just me. I mean, look no further than last year. Puka Nakua set wide receiver rookie records. Why would we draft Marvin Harrison Jr. that high? Mostly his physical attributes and his body of work and what he's demonstrated. It looks like he could be a Hall of Famer. That's why. It looks like he could be a five-time All-Pro. That's why. Okay. There, you Something you said earlier that was interesting was that one player is never more important than multiple players. And if you look at a history of lopsided trades that have been made between teams, sometimes one player is much more valuable than the four players that were received by the other team. That does happen, okay? Uh, a lot of teams thought, well, I'm going to get two or three role players and one good player, and I'm going to trade away a star player. And that team implodes. It doesn't come together. The coaching doesn't know what to do with those role pieces. Those role pieces are thrust into action. The one good player is not actually all that good. And so they got four mediocre to low tier pieces for their hall of famer or their big star, you know, at the end of the day, it just goes to show you that everybody's just giving it their best shot. Nobody really truly knows what players are going to become at the end of the day. Right. That's why, you know, I love, the point you brought up about how sometimes these lopsided trades do work out in the favor of the one player. That's a great point. And it's very, very valid. I'm just, I'm me personally, my mindset is always that this thing's a crapshoot. Give me more darts to throw at the dartboard. You know, the more draft picks I could accumulate, I feel the safer the future is, and, you know, the more you can do with it overall, but Hey, you never know. You really truly never know. Yeah.